Hey, I'm Kaylee Hogan, and this is My Zero Carb Life. I want to talk to you today about one of the primary causes of belly fat. I'm going to explain how this works, and then I'm going to tell you exactly how to fix the problem. So the primary driver of belly fat is insulin. And I'm speaking to you today as someone who used to have a large amount of belly fat. I was 120 pounds overweight, and I carried a large portion of that in my belly as well as my thighs. When I first started my weight loss journey back in 2004, I did that by switching to like a 95% carnivore diet. And Nobody back then bothered checking insulin levels. In fact, I didn't know to do that until just a few years ago, but I was definitely overweight, was definitely inflamed, and that showed up for me in the form of boils and an inflamed sternum. It's called costochondritis. I also had chronic acne and fatigue uh, and anxiety pretty frequently. And now that I've been on 100% carnivore since 2009, My fasting insulin now, and I just had it checked last week, was 1.5. It stays between 1.5 and 2, uh, with an A1C that stays between 4.7 and 5.3. That's where my numbers fall as a 13-year carnivore. And we're going to get into why is that important. As I was learning about insulin and its role on body fat, two of the best resources that I found were Dr. Ben Bickman and Dr. Stan Eckberg, and I'm going to link to their channels below. So if you want to dig in even deeper, amazing resources. All right, let's get started. So when we eat food, especially food with carbohydrates, and especially if those are sugary, starchy carbohydrates, our glucose levels rise. And honestly, that's normal. (laughs) That's a natural reaction to food. But when we eat unnatural foods like highly processed carbohydrates with additives and dyes, excessive sugar combined with excessive amounts of factory-made seed oils, we get unnatural amounts of glucose. And if you don't believe me, just eat anything that is sweet and packaged from a vending machine and then check your glucose with a little cheap glucose monitor before you eat it. And then one hour afterwards, your glucose is going to go far higher with those foods than it will if you eat a big, beautiful ribeye steak. Try, or just skip the sugary junk and trust me. All right, so think of this glucose as a fire. And if the fire that is raging from the foods we eat is not controlled or put out, we could get incredibly sick. We could even go to a coma or die. And this is why it's so important for a type one diabetic to have access to insulin. Their body does not make its own insulin, so they have to get it in the form of a shot or else they'll have major health issues. For those of us that aren't type 1 diabetics, when we eat food that causes our glucose to elevate, our pancreas then produces the hormone insulin. And insulin's primary job, though it has many, its primary job is to keep these fires of glucose under control. Dr. Ben Bickman says to think of insulin as the water that sprays to put out the fire of glucose. I like that. Now, more fire, of course, requires more water. And eating carbs is the primary way to add gasoline to this glucose fire. More glucose requires more insulin. So the pancreas has to keep making more insulin to spray water on the fire. And that's how it's designed to work. Honestly, it's it's a solid system. However, when we have eaten excessive carbohydrates, high levels of carbs for a long time, or when we've eaten highly processed sugary carbs that are coated in these toxic oils, we end up with unnatural amounts of fire that require unnaturally large amounts of water to be sprayed out, put it out. And if everybody just did that, say, once per day, it might be fine. But because many people eat these sugary carbs off and on just all throughout the day, We're just excessively having fire, fire, fire that must be sprayed, sprayed, sprayed all day long. And that may work for a little while, which is why, you know, high schoolers may eat junk food and still look good. But at some point in adulthood, many people start noticing that their blood pressure starts slowly creeping up. At the same time, their waist starts slowly expanding and people usually start feeling less mentally sharp. And we all just go like, oh, aging. Am I right? Am I right? But here's what's really happening below the surface. 
when we have that many fires all day long, and so now we're having to spray insulin all day long, there are parts of our body that stop responding to the hormone insulin. Certain body parts have to literally start ignoring it because it's just been overuse for so long and they can't respond all the time. So insulin is designed to send signals to every cell of our body. Literally every cell of our body gets the call from insulin to do different tasks. And one of these very important tasks is when it signals our smallest blood vessels to dilate or to slightly expand. That is what is supposed to happen. So insulin signals these tiny capillaries to dilate. But when our insulin firemen have sprayed and sprayed and sprayed, these little capillaries eventually have to stop responding all day long. They just can't do that all the time. And when the capillaries stop responding, this is insulin resistance. They're resistant to the call of insulin. That is when they stop dilating and you're going to start seeing your blood pressure go up. Elevated blood pressure is one of the very first signs of insulin resistance. Another early sign is more headaches, especially migraines. And this is due to these little capillaries not responding properly and it restricts blood flow to the brain. And that's a painful proposition. Another early sign, which is less painful, but more troublesome from what I hear, is erectile dysfunction. This is also from a lack of blood flow when people have these capillaries that no longer respond to insulin. So they're not getting blood to some very important areas of their body. We start to get migraines, mental fog, triglycerides on a lipid panel. Triglycerides start to go up. People start to have skin tags. I used to have so many skin tags. I no longer have weight gain in the belly area starts to increase people will feel hungry even after they just ate a meal and they're like how am i still hungry and these are all signs that occur because the firemen are spraying water for so long to put out all of this fire that then our body literally stops responding another part of our body that will respond 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 until it can't is our fat cells Okay, so get this. Insulin, it is a building hormone. It wants things to grow, baby, grow. That's insulin. It's a grower. So some hormones are catabolic, meaning that they want to shrink, shrink, shrink. But insulin is anabolic. It just, its nature is to grow. So when we just keep spraying insulin into our body, it signals our fat cells to grow and grow. They surely do. However, our fat cells can only grow to approximately four to five times the original size before they just max out at capacity. And at that point, in order to preserve themselves, they begin to leak. I know, ew. But what they're leaking is inflammation. And so as a person is starting to see their blood pressure go up, they will also see their waist expanding due to these fat cells expanding. And then they'll start to feel more inflamed, which often will show up as joint pain, sometimes redness in the face as well. And here's what doctors should say. You should go to your doctor at that point and they should say, you are inflamed and you are gaining weight and it's due to your fat cells expanding due to all of the insulin in your bloodstream because of all this glucose in your blood. And it's because you are eating so many carbohydrates. So we're going to need to change your diet and go on either a very low or no carb diet and that's going to allow these fires of glucose to come down it's going to give your insulin a break it's going to allow your little capillaries to start functioning again and that's going to bring down your blood pressure allow your fat cells to stop growing and then they're going to stop leaking inflammation into your bloodstream have a nice day but instead most doctors will simply say your joints probably hurt because it appears you gained some weight and I'm going to need you to take some medication to control your blood sugar and you should probably eat less red meat and exercise more. Oh. Okay, so that is really awful advice, but there was some truth to the part of the exercise more thing when it comes to the fires of glucose and the water of insulin. And that's because muscles love to use glucose. I've heard, heard people say that muscles will just like slurp up glucose. Slurp, slurp. I hate that word, but it's true. So when we work our muscles until they are really tired, we will use up some of the glucose in our bloodstream without needing as much insulin. So in other words, we can put out the fire without requiring the firemen to even show up. And how cool is that? 
Right. So exercise, especially working muscles, is like magic when it comes to reversing insulin resistance, especially if you've stopped setting so many fires in the first place. And when we stop eating all those carbs, we are setting fewer fires and we require less water. One way people do that is simply by doing more fasting. If you're not eating, you're not setting any fire at all. But the good news is, is that if you're eating protein, protein only requires a very small, it's a very tiny fire. It requires very little water. And if you eat fat, fat, test it. Test your glucose before eating straight up fat. Eat a pile of fat trimmings. Eat some bone marrow. Have some cod livers, which are almost entirely fat. Eat tallow bites, which I have the recipe in a YouTube short linked below. It's just fat. Check your glucose one hour later. You will likely see no change at all. Maybe a five point increase. Tiny. And that means you're going to require little to no insulin because there's little to no fire. And the same goes for very fatty meats. You will get very little insulin response from very fatty meat. And that's why after 13 years of eating nothing but animal products, my fasting glucose score is 1.5. So what are we looking for on a fasting insulin score? Dr. Ben Bickman says to, to know if you're insulin sensitive, and that's good. You want to see a six or below on your fasting insulin score. My good friend Danny Conway says that optimal, in her opinion, is around a two to a five. If you're a little lower than that, it's probably because you've eaten nothing but fatty meat in a really long time, as long as your A1C is at a very healthy normal level. If you aren't sure what your A1C and fasting insulin levels are, you can ask your doctor to please have them checked. If your doctor refuses, which is maddening, you could go online to a site that I linked below. It is not a paid affiliation. I just love this company. Anytime I want lab work, I just go on, hit add to cart, it prints off a paper that I take to LabCorp. There's no additional fee at LabCorp. They just draw my blood right then and there. And within 24 hours, I have my results. It's beautiful. But even if you're not getting everything tested, just know that if you're not eating carbs and you're fueling your body with fatty meat, or even if you're eating nothing at all, your insulin levels will decrease. And if you are trying to lose belly fat, or you want to get your blood pressure down, or you want to be free from migraines, or maybe you want certain body parts to function well again, trust me on this, you do want your fasting insulin to come down. And by simply eating fatty meat, avoiding carbs, and doing resistance training, you can do that. Okay, that is the good news. The less good news is that there are some things that will actually make the firemen spray more water onto the fire than we really need. In other words, there are some reasons that we will use more insulin than our glucose really requires. So we will stay more insulin resistant, even if we're eating fabulous foods and moving our bodies. One of the factors that can keep us more insulin resistant is a lack of sleep. Studies have repeatedly shown that if we are deprived of sleep, our bodies will then overreact with more insulin. Same for when we're highly stressed. If the same person eats the same food, but during a very stressful situation versus a calm state in their lives, they will have very different insulin responses to the same amount of carbs, the same amount of protein, and the same amount of fat. And the higher our cortisol is due to stress and lack of sleep, the more likely we are to overproduce insulin and spray excessive water on the same fire. And if you can't do anything about your stress, you can put your higher levels of cortisol to good use. So if you were to slowly and steadily use your muscles, and I'm not talking about long bouts of intense cardio for hours, but if your cortisol is up and your glucose is up, use it because using your muscles will reduce both and that will bring down your insulin. And if your body is stressed, whether it's from a lack of sleep, lack of water, lack of deep breaths, especially nasal breaths, deep belly breaths through your nose. If you're stressed from lack of fuel, lack of nutrients, or from doing excessive amounts of cardio without enough fuel, all of those stressors will cause your body to not bring down your insulin levels. And Dr. Bickman says this is huge. If your insulin levels are high, even if your calories at a deficit, and I see this all the time, people are eating at massive calorie deficits, it is nearly impossible to lose belly fat 
with these super high levels of cortisol. So, you know, let's work on that. Another reason to cut out a lot of these excessive carbohydrates and to focus on eating fatty meat is that the hippocampus of our brain is another body part that becomes unresponsive to this spraying constant spray of insulin. And the hippocampus is the learning and memory center of our brain. It's pretty important. When the hippocampus becomes insulin resistant, it stops drawing up glucose for fuel. And when the brain no longer has proper fuel, it starts turning off the least important parts just to merely survive. And that's when people stop being able to speak or remember names or even chew their own food. And then they are merely alive. And that's what some people call type 3 diabetes. But Dr. Ben Bickman says it's not really type 3. It's just type 2 diabetes that has gone untreated, even with medications, because medications will control the glucose, but it's not controlling how much insulin is being sprayed. And you can still absolutely become insulin resistant while your glucose is being controlled with meds. So even if your A1C is good and your fasting glucose scores look great, you can still have a very high amount of insulin in your blood. And I've seen this happen. And what that means is the water is spraying a lot and it's taking so much water to control what is happening due to the carbohydrate intake. And when that is the case, you can absolutely still suffer symptoms like the migraines, high blood pressure, sexual dysfunction, weight gain, and memory loss. And people may assume that this has nothing to do with diabetes or diet because, wow, their glucose is controlled, their A1C is good. But the real tell is that their diet was still requiring lots of insulin, so their body will still become insulin resistant. It has just started to ignore that constant signaling of the insulin. Okay, I have a little bit more not great news. Another reason that your insulin may still be high is if you have inflammation or infection that was in your body already. So there was a study done on people who had third degree burns. Awful, I know. Um, They were put on a ketogenic diet and were then compared to people who weren't burn victims, but were also put on a ketogenic diet. So one group has suffered this horrific, traumatic, physically damaging injury. Another group was not. They were both put on a ketogenic diet. Over the next three years, the people who had been badly burned remained more insulin resistant than the group who hadn't suffered the injuries despite the fact that they were all on this amazing diet. So if you have been through surgeries or trauma, or you've got underlying illness, it it may take longer to fix your insulin issues, even if your diet is on point. But that is not a reason to give up. It's a reason to stay even more consistent. Because a junky and inflammatory diet would have kept those folks from healing and getting metabolically healthy again, even as soon as they did. And when they were given enough time for healing... And with consistency of diet, they were able to reverse their insulin resistance. It just took up to three years when it took less time for these folks. But they were all able to heal. So please don't give up. I also want to mention that if you have been doing carnivore so hard and you have been doing it, especially if it's been already six months or more, and you are still not feeling good. It is very possible that there is another issue at play. And it is possible that by tweaking your diet, say maybe you take out canned and smoked meats, maybe you take out dairy, you take out some of the seasonings and you tweak your diet. It's possible that that will make you feel better. But for some people, it could be that there was an infection that's never been treated. For others, they've been exposed to a toxin like mold and they have never been able to detox from it because of a genetic issue or because they're still being exposed. Other people may have had damage from excessive antibiotic use or medications or severe trauma that they've never dealt with. And sometimes going more and more strict with your carnivore diet, it's just not going to fix those problems. So sometimes people will need some lab work, supplements, binders, therapy. Maybe like seriously therapy to talk things out or even medications for a while. And that doesn't mean that you are a failure or that you just didn't carnivore hard enough. It may just mean that you need some extra help getting to a place where you feel good and that you have to do a little more work than others do. And that is not a failure on your part. 
Okay, but now in much, much better news, eating a diet that has the most nutrients with the least amount of toxins and junk is the best place to start, especially when it comes to getting your glucose and insulin to a healthy level. And it's going to give you the best chance at healing, no matter what else you have going on. And I've shared some resources in the video's description, where if you have been carnivore for a while and you're still suffering from symptoms, there are some steps that I would suggest that you take. And all hope is not lost. So please take a look at those resources. But if you have never tried eating a diet that is optimal for fixing insulin resistance, why not try a carnivore diet? It completely changed my life. And on a daily basis, I see the way that it helps to heal so many people's health problems, especially insulin resistance. All right, here are my top 10 tips to reverse insulin resistance. Number one, avoid carbohydrates, especially the sugary, starchy, processed carbs. If you're going to eat any carbs at all, I would suggest that they be in the form of whole carbs like vegetables. And I would only eat them at the end of a meal that was full of fatty, fatty meats. I feel my absolute best on an all meat diet. So I skipped the vegetables completely. Um, they were unnecessary and they caused me lots of belly pain. So for me, 100% carnivore is the way. Number two, eat a diet that is full of nutrients and the most nutrient dense, beautiful, healthy foods on earth are meat, eggs, seafood, and dairy. <sighs> Number three, I would build lean muscle mass and you can control this. The more muscle you have, the more space you have to to store any excess glucose. It's like this alternate backdoor to lowering your glucose without even requiring lots of insulin. We want muscle and we're going to get that by working our muscles until they're tired. And then the next time working them a little bit harder. Also eating meat is going to speed up this muscle building process for sure. Number four, sleep. When we are sleep deprived, we use more insulin than we need, even when we eat the same foods. Number five, deal with stress. If you are stressed out and your cortisol is high, you are going to struggle to lower insulin and lose weight. So talk to someone, journal, take deep breaths, pray, go for walks, listen to some encouraging, uplifting music. Tell yourself often, I may be busy, but I am safe. And all of these things are going to help you to relieve stress and deal with it, which will lower your cortisol and help your insulin levels to regulate. Number six, move your body throughout the day, especially after a meal. Walking after meals has a powerful effect on lowering your glucose, which will help bring down the insulin. Less fire, less water. Number seven. Work on your circadian rhythm. So step outside, even if it's just for a couple of minutes, a couple of minutes when the sun is first coming up. And then instead of, you know, people sometimes take a smoke break. Uh, instead of that, I'll take a sky break a few times per day. Just step outside, look at where the sun is in the sky. What you're doing is letting sun rays, really important rays, get into your eyeballs and into your brain, which helps to set our circadian rhythm. Modern day windows in our homes and in our cars will block those very important rays. So just step outside for a few minutes. You could open a window as well or roll down the windows in your car. Um, another way to work on your circadian rhythm is by avoiding blue lights from devices after sundown. So you can do that by either setting your phone to turn red you can do that by wearing blue blocking glasses, which have the red lenses in them, or by just turning it off. And at the end of the day, sitting in a hot tub or reading a book, just relaxing without the screens. But I understand that's hard to do. So I put on my blue blocking glasses. Just those few changes will help a lot of people to improve their leptin. And that can help them to feel more satisfied and help them to sleep deeper. And that's all going to help with your insulin sensitivity. Number eight, having a mindset of positivity and gratitude, going throughout your day, looking for little happy positives, appreciating the beauty and the small things, thinking to yourself, my body can heal. This time is different. Yes, I'm feeling better. There's beauty in this world. Amen. All of that is going to allow your body to heal more than if you stay in this place of angst, control, stress, worry. It, mm, bodies heal better in a spirit of gratitude and positivity. Number nine, 
We can lower our inflammation levels in our body by avoiding inflammatory foods and by eating foods with omega-3s. And remember, when we're less inflamed, we will require less insulin. So I eat seafood at least twice per week, usually more, because omega-3s are fantastic for lowering inflammation. And they've been shown in double-blind clinical studies to improve our insulin resistance. And that was done even in studies on women with PCOS. And it can be really hard for those women to lower their fasting insulin. But eating seafood with omega-3s showed a dramatic improvement on their lab work. And number 10, work on any underlying causes if these diet and lifestyle changes don't fix the problem. And if you just aren't sure how to get started with either a ketogenic, low-carb, or carnivore diet, or you're already doing one of those diets, but you just want to dig a little deeper, uh, check out the resources that are listed below, including the groups that I work with each month. In these small groups, we work on breaking sugar addiction and getting in more movement, how to begin a carnivore or, or keto diet, figuring out your best macros. The group also gives you accountability and gives you a tribe that will support you. And I can help you find resources and research for when carnivore really just isn't enough. I want you to feel great in whatever way you need to get there. But let's at least start by getting our insulin, this water down, less water. And we're going to do that by avoiding all of those processed carby foods. And we're going to work our muscles till they're tired. We're going to get good sleep, deal with stress. We're going to take in some slow, deep nasal breaths. And we're going to talk out our past hurts and traumas, hydrate our bodies well, and give ourselves amazing nutrition. You are not only going to improve your insulin levels, but you're going to improve your quality of life. And you have the best chance at eliminating belly fat. All right, everybody, let's eat the meat and save the humans.